Hi, and welcome to this session with Amazon Web Services Institute, looking at open source. My name is Liam Maxwell. I'm the Director of Government Transformation at AWS. My job is to help governments accelerate their transformations. So we spend a lot of time working across the world with governments who need to make change happen and need to try and find the tools to make those changes happen. Obviously, it's a huge role at the moment for open in government. And we've seen open standards and open source, open data and open markets as some of those key driving themes across government. Open standards, because we all use a common piece of infrastructure, the internet. Open markets, because we want to grow the market and grow our domestic markets to enable small businesses to contribute to government reform and also build digital economies using the public purse. But also, we spend a lot of time thinking about open source and how open source can help us drive reform more effectively. Lots of governments have already done the same things that we want to do in our own governments. And so there's a good way of progressing and accelerating reform. And that's why one of the things we've recently developed at AWS is Open Government Solutions, which, as you can see on the link on your screen now, is a resource which pulls together the solutions that have worked with other governments, the open source solutions that have worked with other governments and help them drive their reforms we use these and we hope you can use these as the building blocks to help you drive your reforms forward. The global COVID-19 pandemic has challenged governments around the world massively to change the way that they work and to change the speed at which they work and also the services they have to provide. Open source technologies have played a huge role in that. They've enabled governments to move faster, to move at speed, to move with the security that they need to maintain public trust. So today we're going to talk about that phenomenon of open source and how it's changing governments around the world. And I'm really pleased to be joined by three leading experts from around the world who are going to help us understand what this is, what it can help us do, how it works, and what it means for those of us who want to transform and who want to drive reform in government. Jamie Boyd is the Chief Digital Officer of the Government of British Columbia. And she's previously served as the Director of Open Government in the Government of Canada. Welcome, Jamie. Matthew Kane is the Head of Digital at the London Borough of Hackney. He previously led the digital strategy for Buckinghamshire County Council. And Matthew is the author of a recent blog on Medium in, entitled Why AWS's Open Government Platform Could Revolutionize Government Innovation. And Peter Ulander is the Director of Open Source at AWS Marketing. So, to start with, I want to turn to Peter for the first question. Peter, how would you explain to someone who's not a technology expert, what is open source? And why has there been so much interest and uptake in this around the world? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think in the most simplest of terms, open source software, open source technologies is uh, a product where you actually get to see how it was made, what was the source, what are the bits and pieces that the creator put in to make it work. But what extends it to make it really cool is that you get the four freedoms of open source, which is you have the right to use it, modify it, or distribute it without any cost, right? And, and I think the reason why this is really taken off over the past couple of decades, both in consumer spaces and business spaces and in government spaces, is the fact that it embodies a certain spirit um, in how products are created, right? It's an open exchange of ideas. Uh, it's collaborative participation, regardless of who you work for or what country you might be part of. Um, it, because of that, you get rapid ideation. All politics are pushed aside and people are focused on solving a problem. And that community-oriented development really kind of creates opportunity for everybody who participates in it. So I think it's, it's, it's a, a neat movement that drives fast ideas that anyone can participate in. Um, and that's why it's, it's grown so fast in, in its adoption from a global perspective. And I think the neat thing, especially if you're not a technologist, the things that people probably don't realize 
is open source is in your cars, it's in your TV, it's on your phone, it's in the planes that you're part of, right? Open source has become just a foundational platform for how we build product or consume technology. It generally, you know, it exists everywhere. Jamie and Matthew, you've both been very vocal supporters of open source within government. Um, Jamie, could I come to you first? Um, what, what do you see as the benefits to your government of open source? Absolutely. It's a great question. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here joining you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people on the west coast of Canada. Uh, I um, have the privilege of serving in the government of British Columbia, westernmost province of Canada, 5 million people. Here in our government, I see a number of different benefits associated with a, a really robust open, open source practice. Um, a few different ones that stand out for me. Ultimately, when we, when we use open source, we get better products, a better ecosystem, a better government, and ultimately better services to the people of British Columbia. In terms of the products themselves, we're talking about products that we can get off the ground faster. Uh, we can ship them faster because we have the, uh, the ability to reuse code. They're often cheaper. We can focus our efforts on customizing them to the needs of our people rather than building them from scratch. We can iterate. We can be part of a, a, part of a community and support open innovation. In terms of the ecosystem, our ability to work well with vendors is much greater. Uh, we can avoid vendor lock-in more, more easily, support economic development, uh, talent. I mean, our, our developers prefer to work in the open. Uh, they're able to expand their set of collaborators. They're able to build these, these robust teams that are, that are parts of, of distributed communities. Um, we're able to take advantage of the knowledge of the crowd for um, security purposes, you know, community deployment of patches, the, the, the benefits of white hat hackers. Um, we also have a better government, better value to taxpayers, accountability. We believe that you should know what your government is up to um, and you should know how public resources are being expended. And ultimately, when we take all of those advantages together, we believe that we end up with better services for the people that we serve. That's a great answer. Matthew, yeah. stop that. Look, I think, yeah, I, I can't. The, 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 these are absolutely the right answers, and this is why we also use open source. I think just picking up on um, what, what Jamie just said, uh, our mayor talks in Hackney talks of um, the taxpayer shouldn't have to pay twice for innovation. Of course, he's, he, he's totally right. Um, I, I think fundamentally, you know, what, why am I the head of digital in Hackney? Because we need to start with the user and work backwards. Um, and we need to do that in a context where um, it, we um, need to respond to people's rising expectations. Um, if Jeff, Jeff Bezos um, says annually that um, customers' expectations are, are, are rising at an inexorable rate um, and it's hard for, for Amazon to keep up, then you can imagine how scary that is for a small organisation like ours. Um, so if we're starting with the user and working backwards, um, and it's our duty as public servants um, to ensure that we can meet those changing needs um, of, of our citizens, and we can only do that by standing on the shoulders of giants. So we can only meet the, the raising expectations of our residents by um, starting with, with what's already there and, and, and building on it, as opposed to investing yet again um, with a proposition that's already been well rehearsed. So, so I think one of the things we all saw um, after years and years of all of us working together in, in, in government and then thinking our oh, governments take ages to do things and things are slow. I mean, we've all reflected in the last four months of what's happened around the world when governments have said, oh, we're gonna go and move fast. Governments can really, really move fast. And Jamie, I was quite attracted by your, your, your line about speed. Is that how does open source enable, thing, enable governments to move faster? Well, it really is a question of being able to get things off the ground. Uh, and and I'm, I'm happy to give you a couple of specific examples, two that really stand out from the government of British Columbia. Um, one is our work around identity. So British Columbia is the first jurisdiction in North America to take our driver's license and our health ID card and unify them into a single piece of identity. It's called the BC Services Card. Um, the code base associated with the, the, the digital supports for that is entirely open source. It's one of the most forked repos that we have, um, and we have a global network of contributors. Um, that work has been absolutely critical for having secure interactions on the internet for the people we serve. Um, and that code base is available to any developer, not just within the government of British Columbia, but around the world. 
right? And so when it comes to launching a new secure uh, service and having that secure identity tool, it, I mean, it's not as simple as plugging it in, but it's a lot closer than it would be if you had to build an identity solution from scratch. Right? And so having those components, those, those repeatable design patterns, means that our various teams can really focus on their area of expertise rather than building you know, things that, that are predictable in government. We all know that we'll have to you know, notify people. Notify is a great repeatable design pattern. That sort of, um, a, of a function is something that just lends itself very easily to open source. Um, the other set of examples is, of course, in our in our digital COVID response, um, and there the ability to leverage a code base um, various times certainly helped us to respond more decisively. Great, Matthew. What about your response yeah. to COVID? Because I know you made good use of open source in that in Hackney. Right. So um, I think picking up on a couple of the ideas Jamie's just uh, talked about. Um, the, the, the first is um, about scale. Um, so when you're working in a subnational government like ours, um, we, we are serving some 300,000 residents. We're confident that if we reuse a piece of technology that's being created by um, a, a larger government um, or a, um, a, a vendor working at scale, then when something is found out that could be improved about that, um, it will be found out before, before we could find out. And probably the, the, the issue will have been fixed and before we have, will have even identified it existed. So open source for us is about scale. I, I think the second part um, is we believe passionately in small pieces loosely joined. So what that's meant is that we can um, take I individual parts of the solution, string them together to create a new proposition. So for example, our service to um, support vulnerable residents through coronavirus, we created over a weekend and that used elements of the design of gov.uk, which we could take from central government free of charge without asking. Um, it used um, APIs that we had already developed um, locally um, to um, support our tenants and um, leaseholders who, who live in our housing estates. Um, it used our um, server infrastructure um, already set up on uh, AWS um, and reporting into our business intelligence tool. So it, it enabled to take these um, small components to put them together very quickly to achieve a different outcome. And, and when we talk about responding rapidly to residents changing expectations, it, it's very much about how, how can we make sure that as people need something different, um, we can respond to that proactively rather than having to say, no, sorry, Minister, that can't be done for the next year because the computer says no. The, the, the other part of... Um, uh, what Jamie explained, which I find really exciting, is there'll be lots of governments around the world who don't have the capabilities of taking code from GitHub and, 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 and reusing it and, uh, and, and, and applying it to a different circumstance. So what we've done in Hackney um, is to make sure that every single um, thing that we produce in the course of producing a service for our residents can be reused. So whether that's as small as a piece of user research that we've published openly um, in order that other uh, organisations can learn from what um, we've found from our residents through to a line of code or anything in between, um, it enables collaboration uh, either at the project level or at the software level or indeed at the service design level. Great. And those are really good examples of just showing the speed and the scale that you can work at. Peter, if I come to you, I mean, you work for AWS, which is a commercial company. And I mean, the idea about a commercial company is that you sell things to make money. But open source is free. So tell me, what's, the, what's, what's in it for you? What's in it for us at AWS? <laughs> well, that's, that, that's, uh, that's a funny way of looking at it. Open source, while the premise is freedom, it doesn't necessarily mean it's always free. There's always an associated cost with it. And I think both Matthew and Jamie have done a great job articulating the fact that, you know, ultimately as, a, as government entities go, you don't want to have to recreate the wheel over and over and over again. And you want to make this uh, technology accessible to everyone around the globe. Well, the hardest part about open source is actually getting it from the GitHub repo, installing it on your machine and getting it ready to go scale. That will, in many ways, take months, in some cases years, for a lot of organizations to get up and running. And so from an Amazon perspective, what's really interesting is we have a lot of customers that come to us 
um, uh, to effectively run their most critical open source projects. And so when you think about uh, how we build things like Redshift or manage streaming for Apache Kafka, or our RoboMaker platform. These are all based on open source projects that are super important to our customers. And what we do is basically take care of the maintenance, the install, the scale, the service that enables the freedom for governments like uh, you know Matthew and Jamie to, to go innovate, right? You don't have to worry about building the foundation first. Amazon steps in and does that. But it's not just about making open source projects easy for our customers. We also strive to be really good community members and leverage a lot of that crowdsourcing that you, you hear Matthew and Jamie talk about. So our participation in open source on top of the services that we deliver is we actually maintain 2,500 various projects on GitHub. Right. And that can include large initiatives like open distro for um, uh, uh, kind of enterprise search or Firecracker, which is a really interesting developer tool to um, MXNet, which is a, an AI ML engine that sits inside of Apache. These are projects that our engineers have created in Amazon and we've put out into various foundations to get the knowledge of the crowd engaging, using, innovating excuse me, on top of the platform. So it's really fun to be part of that. The third thing I will bring up though, that is also super critical for Amazon's role in open source is we actually look at our role in the ecosystem, whether it's commercial open source or pure, you know, individual driven, driven open source to be that force multiplier, to be, you know, as Matthew nicely put it, standing on the shoulders of giants. Part of that is using our breadth and our reach to bring together a number of open source projects so that our customers, our governments can find them, use them, move forward with them. And that can come from the simplest of, of ways and just showing up to a, a conference or an event, or it presents itself in a very specific implementation like Liam, what you've built with the open government solutions, taking open source projects from around the globe and bringing them together so that we can share them with various governments. Because the second hardest thing on top of, of, of installing and maintaining is actually finding the code and seeing what's available. And so we play a really interesting aggregator role in that sense. So as you can see, open source is super critical to, to, to Amazon, but it's more important in the way that we service and engage with our customers uh, and empower them and enable them to innovate quickly. So a lot of this is about speed and getting that, that ability to get to speed, but also government is for everybody. So it's about scale as well. Jamie, you talked a little bit there about your, your combination of identity and, and, um, and driving license and, and health system. Um, I wonder, could you, are there any other examples you could give us where you've, you've really enabled the, the local and um, the more strategic approaches to um, open source within the British Columbia? Sure. Uh, very happy to give you a few examples. And I, I think just, you know, in the interest of, of being timely, I'd love to speak to a few of the examples that made up our, our, our digital response to COVID. Um, so in British Columbia, uh, we, we did act quite quite quickly and decisively. Um, so right away, um, thought about the, the user experience, the citizen experience. Um, and, and we're a government that's made extremely strong commitments. We've talked about um, working to, to restore public services and make opportunities available to everyone. That's right in our core mandate. So right away, we launched a symptom checking uh, application. 200,000 downloads in the in the first few weeks. Uh, we created a landing page, gov.bc.ca slash COVID-19. In the first uh, few weeks, over 2 million visits, daily briefings. We launched a digital assist assistant, so um, a chat bot. Um, over 500,000 se sessions in the first few weeks. Um, and so we launched this, this suite of digital services, um, largely through partnerships, um, lots of support for virtual home care, so home health monitoring. Um, and right away, there were over 1,000 patients being monitored in their homes, people who were vulnerable or who'd been exposed to or potentially exposed to, to COVID. One of the great examples of an open source project that made up uh, a big part of our COVID response was our travel screening app. Um, so in early April, 
we created this new digital service um, that essentially allowed people to submit their self-isolation plans and receive checking calls from Service BC. Um, that was a fully open source solution, which we thought was a good idea for a variety of reasons. But what was really interesting was when there was then demand for additional similar services. So we needed to have a similar kind of service for temporary foreign farm workers, as well as silviculture operators. And so we were able to stand those new services up in a matter of days because our original solution for, um, for travel screening was fully open source. Uh, on top of that, we had a lot of support for the broader uh, open source community. So in Canada, with um, in collaboration with the government of Canada, we launched something that uh, that was called Open Call, um, and it's essentially uh, a way of helping governments find similar services, like uh, as as Petter was very clearly uh, nicely referring to, um, and really looking at what are the different open source solutions that governments had stood up to respond to COVID-19, um, as well as an offer for free technical support. Um, so it's really just a, a catalog, and so a number of the government of British Columbia's open source COVID response solutions were were put up there. Um, so, you know, those sorts of very tactical and specific moves, I think, have been very helpful. Um, other governments across Canada have used our code. The government of Alberta has used our travel screening app code. Um, you know, and just ongoing support for these broader open source communities has been extremely helpful in having a decisive digital response. Yeah, we're getting back to that same thing that governments don't compete. So you can share and you can collaborate and that's the really the really um great component here is that if a lot of the work's been done for you then you're able to focus on the things that really you know you can leverage the open source and focus on the things which really matter matthew think about um uh in hackney I just could you give me a couple of examples there of um of, of where your your more strategic approaches to to this have, have come to bear fruit one of the things we've seen throughout the crisis is the need to work in partnerships um, of often partnerships that haven't existed up until now, whether that's with local volunteer groups, established organisations, um, or, or, or working across um, partnerships uh, in different public bodies. So by being able to take this approach, we have been able to ensure that data flows more freely through the system, um, to ensure that when we're um, talking about Mrs Smith, it is the same Mrs Smith at the same address with the same um, issues, um, regardless of um, which telescope you're, you're looking through. Um, uh, about ensuring that um, we're funneling resource to the, the bits of the system um, that most needs it at, at that point. Now, the truth is, there'll be people listening to the call today who will be thinking that this is ridiculous. Government is creating a new overhead of a code base that they can't possibly um, continue to maintain. Um, and there are plenty of commercial vendors who've already fixed these problems. You know, what, why is it that um, a, a single council in, in, in London is, is going off and building yet another set of forms and, and, and yet another database and you know, yet another identity verification system. And, and, and the truth is um, that often these people are the same people who would gladly use 20 different apps on their phone to do 20 different things. They wouldn't expect one app on their phone to, 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 to do all the things and yet somehow believe that using a single system in, in, in the workplace is the right response and that the way that you um, extract speed from that single system is to shout louder at the vendor. Now we all know that uh, in fact in, a, uh, in, a, in an age of austerity as we've certainly been in, in, in the UK and, and, and much of um, Western Europe of, of late, um, vendors know this. Um, and, and so shouting louder when you're going to pay less money in, in your license fees next year doesn't work very um, well as a tactic. So we're talking passionately today about open source because we believe in a mixed ecology uh, of vendors. Um, but fundamentally, we, we know that as technologists, the conversation we need to be having with our elected officials um, is about being able to have control over the user experience. If we're outsourcing that user experience to a large national um, uh, software provider uh, with whom we've got, you know, one three hundred and fiftieth um, of their uh, attention, we are not going to get the kind of speed and transformation that our um, politicians expect because it's what the residents demand of us. So we're passionate about open source, not as an end in itself, um, but a means of enabling us to use technology to respond to people's various expectations. And like, and like many of these examples we have across um, the public service, it, it's about control. 
It's about enabling you to have the control to build the services that you want for your citizens. So this all sounds fantastic and great, but I, I'm, I'm sort of struck by the fact that, you know, there is quite a lot of skepticism here, particularly around trust and security. And let's think about this. I mean, surely open source is massively open. I mean, bugs and security is always very difficult in this circumstance. Is that really true? Peter, can we just no. talk a little bit about how you build confidence and how you build the, um, the, the, the trust in the security of the solutions that you're, yeah. you're offering? Yeah, no, that, and, and that's, that's, that's a fair perception. I don't know that it's entirely accurate. And, and here's why. I think when, when you look at governments or, or customers or you know, innovators as they choose open source, they choose it for a number of factors. You've brought up the control factor extremely well so far this morning on the call. However, people turned open source because of security. And I think, Jamie, you, uh, you actually articulated it super well. When you're crowdsourcing a solution, and two, it's not because of a bunch of com competition. You're actually collaborating together to go find uh, a common uh, uh, endpoint or a common solution. Everybody works together to go plug holes. In fact, there's there's a number of I, I wish I had the stats on hand. There's a number of stats out there that show that when you see security exploits, you'll actually see them identified earlier and solved faster in open source than you do in proprietary technologies. And the reason for that is the number of eyeballs that are participating in this. Imagine, I mean, take any organization, take a 10,000 person organization when they adopt open source, they now have millions of developers solving their problems. That execution in itself helps basically solve any of the security issues. Now, trust is the other one. And I, I think, and, and Matthew and Jamie, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but speed is what matters from a trust perspective. Are you innovating on my behalf fast enough to solve the needs? Or are you spending your time negotiating procurement deals with big proprietary software vendors in a different country, right? Speed matters. And that builds community trust. And as you see just the collaboration across Canada, across the world, that that kind of drives the expectations higher within the um, constituents and the communities, and it increases that trust level. And then finally, I'll go back on the freedom, right? It's, it's not free as in beer. This stuff is about freedom, freedom to move, freedom to innovate, freedom to engage. And I think a big thing, especially for, um, uh, for governments, that freedom from the cost and the, the kind of lock-in from proprietary technology is super important with regards to their own platforms and how they're growing and innovating for the community. And so that again builds into that trust model. I think those are the that's the way I kind of look at this stuff. Jamie, your views on trust and security running the services for a major province in in Canada. Yeah, Surely it's a security is a massive concern, and isn't open source a real concern for you? Well, I mean, I'm on this call. I'm obviously a huge open source fan. Um, but really, to the point, I, I think so often people will start talking about the risk matrix. Um, I would encourage us to look at the opposite. What is the risk associated with not adopting open source solutions? Um, that risk is failure to deliver timely and relevant services to our people. It's the risk of not having access to, to timely patches. You look at any government and they have just a network of, of applications, many of which have not been maintained. These are critical systems that are, are often invested in. And then because of contractual arrangements, it's a one-time investment and then they won't get ongoing investment for three, four years. You think of the vulnerabilities associated with an application that hasn't been maintained in a number of years. I would argue that the, that, that risk is far greater um, than any of the risks that come with open source. Now, there, there's certainly, I don't want to make light of it. There are all sorts of different things that, that can happen, um, you know, from an ethics perspective. I'm obviously very, very strongly um, in favor of having open algorithms, open data um, to, to support part of that, that open ecosystem. Um, 
from a privacy perspective, if you have exclusively open data, um, yes, there can be a risk of the mosaic effect taking hold, folks aggregating data sets um, that perhaps are coming from third parties and creating privacy risks. Um, algorithms, you know, if you put out a, an open algorithm that then somebody, um, you know, is, is being used to make recommendations on, you know, identifying nefarious activity, can you then game it more easily? Perhaps. Um, but I would argue that it, it's appropriate and good for us to be open by default. So we default to open unless there's a good reason not to, right? If there is a reason that um, a certain code base is going to have additional vulnerability uh, associated with it because we make it open, then let's talk about that. But really, m my view is the risk matrix associated with not being open is far greater. Um, so that's a big part of it. And then the second part of it is, how do we generate trust? Well, we deliver excellent services, reliable, timely services. And we do that every day of the week. And I have to say, in, in my practitioner's experience, uh, open source helps us do that well. Thanks. Matthew, you run the, the technology and the, the solutions for a, local, a unitary local authority. That means you do hold some extremely secure data. Um, and so are you not concerned by the, and how do you address the issues that people have with um, concern over the security of such information? So firstly, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and, and to give you a sense of that, um, we've recently promised to give all 16 year olds who leave care a, a copy of their care record. We can be talking 12,000 sheets of um, A4 paper uh, for a 16 year old leaving care. Um, and, and that will be their life story. We, we get an increase in requests after Christmas time when due to you know, a, a family discussion over the Christmas uh, dinner table, someone wants to know actually, you know, where am I from, who am I? Um, so, so this is deeply um, personal data. Um, but fundamentally, we're talking about shifting from a world where if something goes wrong, you previously sent Colin with a screwdriver into the basement um, to a world in which you can work with thousands in, in Hackney, hundreds of developers across the UK and, and, and more broadly across the world, tens of thousands of developers in order to safeguard the security of um, the supply of your technology um, securely to, to, to residents um, and, and staff at the point at which they're accessing it. Now, if you and your CIO believe that you are better served by sending Colin with a screwdriver into the basement, uh, and that's the most secure way to, to run your technology, good luck. Um, but for us, um, our, our perspective is that the, the smartest way to um, keep things secure for our residents is about small pieces loosely joined, um, where we are uh, able to work with a very large community, um, ideally globally, of experts in this stuff, who will find out um, the problem and the solution to the problem far faster um, than Colin and his screwdriver would ever have had a chance to. Yeah, great, great, great to hear about poor Colin. Um, but also, it's really important to 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 think about that. And it's in terms of the scale, isn't it? It's the scale and the speed. Could I just think then? I mean, we it's just it is a slightly utopian discussion we're having. But you're actually living and breathing and delivering this on the ground for your citizens every day. And so, can I just think? Think about the future, think about 10 years time. In the next 10 years, what do you hope to see governments do that will enable the agenda of speed, scale, security to be delivered? Jamie, could I come to you first? Absolutely, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, and it's particularly wonderful because I think that governments can take very specific measures to deliver on the potential of open source and open government more broadly. When we talk about open government, it's a government that embraces transparency, accountability, citizen participation, innovation, all of these things are things that we want in, in the public sector around the world. Um, and for open source, I, I, I do see a number of specific tactical things that we can consider. Um, first of all, I think that we can build and iterate in the open. Um, so for us in the government of British Columbia, we've gotten ourselves organized around, um, well, all of our code is available through github.com slash bcgov, um, and you'll find almost 800 repos in there. 
Um, so you can go in there and you can see us iterating and improving in real time. You can see that we're part of an active community that we value to a huge degree. Um, you know, the, the, the examples abound. Um, there are all sorts of really robust communities and not just communities that we convene, communities that we contribute to. Um, you can look at these replicable design patterns and, and that allows us to really focus on our greatest value added, which is uh, customizing and serving our unique communities within British Columbia. Um, we've heard a couple of times, you know, the idea that open source is free, you know, for me at least, it's not free. It's very expensive, <laughs> but I get to spend the money on the things that add the greatest value, right? And so another tactic, you can use procurement to really advance open source. Um, in the government of British Columbia, we have two procurement programs that have been transformative, transformative Code With Us and Sprint With Us. Um, Code With Us is really making sure that people who are contributing lines of open source code are getting paid for that, so smaller procurements. Um, and Sprint With Us is our ability to hire agile teams um, and the whole team. Right, and so we've uh, they're they're relatively new programs, um, but we've put up about fourteen million dollars worth of uh, of procurement through those programs, and that really has shown that we we don't necessarily need to spend a huge amount of money to get a lot of value. Um, we have to, I think, uh, be better as governments in recognizing that we are reference clients. In many of our cases, we are the biggest technology organization in our in our community. Um, and so when when folks are showing up, it's it's useful for us to think about our procurement systems as being something that should be easily navigable for our vendor community. Um, and we can really adopt agile practices and support that through our procurement. Similarly, we can think about licensing. So um, under those procurement programs that I just referenced, we require our, um, our solutions to be submitted under the Apache 2.0 license or an equivalent license. Um, and the vendor will provide us with the release that they've built with us, but then they can go off and have further commercialization of the solution. Right. And so we have to recognize that we're part of an ecosystem where people do need to make a living um, and government, you know, has a role in that. And finally, we can support ecosystems. Um, so we are uh, an important convener uh, as the public sector. Um, and I think that we set the tone. Um, and so when we come out and we say in British Columbia, we are buying open source solutions, the rest of the community sort of wakes up there, they, they pay attention, right? Um, you know, a similar kind of thing when, when we come out and we say, we believe as a government that to collaborate on the internet, you have to have trust and we're going to invest heavily in our trust over IP service. We're going to invest in, in this case, the Hyperledger Aries community um, and that project. Well, now people get uh, excited about being part of that community. Um, and so you can really be, I, I think, an important convener and contributor to these, these loosely distributed uh, uh, networks and communities that are really focused on service delivery. Thanks, Jamie. Ma Matthew, that's a, uh, um, a really strong vision. What about for, for Hackney and for, for local authorities across the UK? What's going to what's be like in 10 years' time? Yeah, so um, if only we knew, um, the uh, budget deficit facing us at the moment is, is non-trivial. Um, but that is the core point uh, from my perspective. A part of me dies every time someone says they've got a transformation programme because it gives the impression as though transformation is a thing which is going to be achieved and you just need to manage in a linear fashion until that, that thing is ticked off the list. The fact is, the ability to um, respond rapidly to people's changing expectations is a core organizational capability. And, and therefore, setting a target to be able to deliver value to your citizens every two weeks in response to um, their changing needs it is incredibly important and needs to be worked um, towards and needs to be uh, constantly pursued as a uh, as, as a sign of organizational health. So we don't know where we're going to be in, in five years. We don't know what our residents are going to require in five years. What we do know is that tools like Open Government Solutions gives us the building blocks um, in order to be able to ensure that we can respond to whatever the organization requires of us, whatever our um, place requires of us, um, and whatever the needs of our citizens are to a far greater level of certainty in a way which is far more inclusive and far more aware of the part we're playing in the local economy um, and the part we're playing in making Hackney a place for everyone 
than we could by writing a large check to a single vendor. Yeah, that's a really interesting and, and completely different approach to the IT and the, the approach to technology that we saw 10, 15, five years ago. And that's, uh, I, I, it's, it's really impressive that you're both really talking about taking control and being in a position where you can control your destiny and the destiny of your organization to help meet citizens' needs. So leverage these common resources and focus on what makes your citizens work and your citizens' engagement more effective and, 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 and more, um, more meaningful, I suppose, in, in terms of engagement with government. So, Peter, could I come to you just to have a think about a difficult question always to ask an Amazonian, which is, you know, the crystal ball. I'll give you 10 years down the track. Where do you think governments are going to be? Yeah. And the services that they're going to be looking for? So, uh, I, I'm a big believer in history is a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen in the future. And what's interesting is to look at the role open source has played across the world in governments for the last 20 years. Um, when it first started, uh, or let, let's, let's peg ourselves here just around the year 2000, we saw huge initiatives from Brazil, from uh, uh, Vietnam, from Japan, where the government's basically focused on saying, look, open source creates a new hub of innovation that enables our economy to grow faster and so they move quickly to drive incentives um, tax incentives to their their groups their their constituents the the companies within region that said if you start using deploying and innovating in open source we're going to give you more benefit and that saw um, uh, in many ways it was it was the beginnings of the bridging of the digital divide between the haves and the have nots and it gave huge opportunity to communities and 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 countries with regards to building up their own economy fast forward to today what i love to see is the fact that we we, we have governments like what jamie's talking about up in bc and what what, what matthew's talking about um uh, out there in the uk it's it's fascinating to see that it's no longer about pushing open source to your 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 uh, business leaders but it's actually now consuming open source to provide better services for your constituents your users your environments if i look 10 years out the spirit of innovation the transparency, the open government, the, you know, all of the collaboration to solve common issues, like what we just saw with regards to, to, to COVID. It was a fascinating exercise to see how people put all of their differences aside and said, we're going to go solve for this major human issue that we've got to solve for, not only within our own borders, but across the globe. That's where I think I'd like to see um, government moving is moving from embracing open source then adopting open source but actually now operating in an open and transparent excuse me transparent model which is beyond the source itself it's actually become the open source way great that's going to be a really fascinating way of seeing how fast governments can work and using this to accelerate governments and i think um jamie and, and matthew it's been fantastic to hear your experience and your thoughts about what the future holds but also how we can work together to make that a reality through collaboration, through not competing, through actually collaborating and getting speed by working together. Can I just ask you both for just one line at the end of this to think about this? You, a lot of the people that have seen this, it's the first time to really talk about open source, first time to think about it. What would you like them to go away thinking of our listeners the first things to do to try to understand how they can work with open source more effectively and what it could mean for them. Matthew. Default to working in the open. If everything you do is inherently open, you will find you are already building a community. You are already um, tapping into expertise in your citizen base. And whether that's in the way that you um, design procurement briefs, and the way that you share research findings, the way that you share performance data about your services, and then ultimately the, the, the code that you write. I think by working in the open by default, you will find yourself part of a community that can help you respond to users changing expectations. 
Thanks, Matthew. And Jamie, the amazing reforms you've made in British Columbia. What should someone walk away with, with the one thing in their head of how can they start to work in that way? For me, the the fourth industrial revolution and all, all the new tools that have, have become available in the public sector really do mean that governments can do better. We've never been better placed to deliver excellent user-centric services to the people we serve. Um, in that kind of an environment, our communities can help. They can tell us, hey, you're, there's a digital divide here. Think about all of us. Um, we have specific needs here. Think about uh, think about everybody sitting on the margins of, of our societies. And, and when we build in the open, when we build together uh, with communities, for communities, we ultimately get better outcomes. And, and that's why governments exist. Government exists to serve people. Um, and being open helps us do that more effectively. Well, I can't really top that as a, not only as a sense, as an aim, but also something that we can see as achievable. And Jamie, Matthew, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you found this interesting to listen to and that you'll be able to find your route to um, using open source to help drive your government transformations faster, with more security, and with the scale that you need to provide government for everyone. Thank you very much.